Hi, uh, thank you so much for being here for the Grappling with Government in the Digital Age webinar. So if you're watching this as a parent, an educator, or someone who just wants to learn more about social media legislation, we are so glad that you could be here today for such a crucial uh, conversation. My name is Lola Bessis. I'm the lead intern at Digital for Good. I'm here to welcome you to our Grappling with Government in the Digital Age webinar. And we're joined with policy consultant Anita Rao, which we are so lucky to be here with, and uh, who you'll get to learn more about in just a moment. Before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about Digital for Good. So we are a nonprofit that educates students and adults about digital citizenship, safety, wellness, as well as literacy. Through our programs and events, we aim to celebrate youth innovation, empower student change makers, and promote digital safety. Digital for Good reaches thousands of students nationwide, and our impact is amplified even further by the Train the Trainer learning module featured in our curricula. At the foundation of our work is the idea that students are at the core of the solution to online toxicity. The more we can do to train, guide, and support our students, the more likely they are to take a positive action. As a brief reminder before we get started, we have opened a chat feature to comment and questions from the audience. We will be holding a Q&A session after the presentation if you have any questions. So if you want your question to be featured in the segment, please add two pound or hashtag signs to the beginning of your question. Feel free to drop in questions throughout the webinar and we'll get to them at the end uh, during the Q&A session. And now without further ado, allow me to introduce our guest speaker, Anita Rao. Anita Rao works at the intersection of technology and public policy. As a recent tech fellow in the U.S. Senate, she worked on a variety of issues ranging from data privacy and online safety as well to artificial intelligence. Previously, Anita was a senior software engineer at Qualcomm, where she worked on cutting-edge technologies like 5G and AI, and advocated for expanding Internet access to communities across the country. She holds a B.S. in Electrical Engineering from Columbia University, as well as a Master's in Computer Science from Georgia Institute of Technology with a Machine Learning Specialization. Thank you so much for joining us today, Anita, and I'll pass things over to you. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction. Um, great to meet you all. Thanks for joining today. I wanted to quickly just start with the topic um, and the title of this presentation, which is Grappling with Government in the Digital Age. In other words, really, we're trying to figure out what's going on with government in this transformative time of technology and AI and social media. And since that's such a big topic and I couldn't possibly cover it in the time I have, I wanted to narrow it to the specific topic of online safety and specifically kids online safety because of the audience that we have today with parents and educators. Um, so I just wanted to start with the state of play. Um, you know, this was a list of stats that was compiled by DoSomething.org back in 2019. There's been further research um, as it relates to kids' online safety and cyberbullying. But about 37% of young people between the ages of 12 and 17, teenagers, have been bullied online, and 30% have happened, it's happened to more than once. 95% of teens in the U.S. are online, and so the Internet and social media is one of the most common mediums for cyberbullying. In the LGBTQ plus community, students also experience online harassment. About half of students do, which is a rate higher than average. Um, Instagram is a social media site where a lot of young people are reporting cyberbullying or experiencing harassment. Um, and interestingly, self-reported by young people, 83% believe that social media companies should be doing more to tackle cyberbullying on their platforms. And only one in 10 teen victims will inform a parent or trusted adult if they are abused online. And so these are some really staggering statistics, and it's motivated, I think, parents as well as lawmakers to make the online space and community much safer. Go to the next slide, please. Now, because we know that this is such an important topic, I did want to talk about some recent reporting that came out of the National Academies of Sciences. So this is the collective National Academy, um, scientific National Academy for the United States. And they do a lot of research in science, engineering, mathematics, and health. And they were sort of authorized by Congress to 
do a report on looking at the relationship between social media and teen mental health. And I think many of us would think that you just find, you know, statistics like the previous slide, just obvious causation. And they didn't find that to be exactly the case. They did did find that for, you know, young people who already are at risk of mental health issues, social media can exacerbate that problem. But also, you know, they found that social media just may not be the one and sole cause for all teen mental health crises. And so I bring this up not to say that, you know, we need to look away from the problem or that we need to come, you know, only look at social media. I think I bring this up to say that this is actually an ongoing debate. And because it's an ongoing debate, there is, you know, a, there is a sense from Congress, from parents that we need to do something, but that something is still a little bit of a gray area. And that's why there's active debate in terms of legislation. And there have been a lot of efforts to kind of tackle this problem, but there hasn't just been quite yet um, exact consensus. And so it's a challenging problem and we're still working to figure that out. Next slide, please. So just to, you know, um, illustrate that point. I wanted to walk through a brief history. These are not all the events, but some, you know, some key events in terms of the history of child safety laws. And so in 1984, um, you know, President Ronald Reagan officially established the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NECMEC, um, to combat child sexual exploitation, a really, you know, sensitive and heavy topic, but one that basically, you know, the federal government agreed was was worth tackling at that level. Um, and this, uh, you know, NECMEC has become, it is a nonprofit, but it's become, you know, one of the de facto um, organizations for working with the federal government, working with, um, you know, civil society groups, uh, researchers and academics to um, not only be a reporting location for parents who have had children experience abuse, but also, again, inform the research community, inform legislators on what, what kind of solutions could we, could we be taking to address this problem. Um, in 1998, we actually had legislation passed, the Children's Online Protection Act, um, which actually criminalized the distribution of harmful content to minors. And again, I think on its face, all of this sounds like we're moving in the right direction, but we have had rollbacks of some legislation. And I think sometimes the question is, is why is that? And it can be because of really specific things like the definition of harmful content, right? When in legislation, we don't define what harmful content means exactly. You can have instances where social media companies in an effort to be compliant with the law, and I guess in 1998, maybe it wasn't social media, but other types of websites, in order to be compliant with the law, do wide sweeping removals of content, things that could actually be helpful resources, right, to a, a child who's going through a mental health crisis. And even those are taken down from, um, from the website. And so you'll start to see this trend, this kind of um, trade off between safety being at odds sometimes with privacy and free speech. And we'll kind of see that in this, um, you know, set of, in, in these dates. In 2008, you have the Internet Safety Technical Task Force that was created. So you actually had states, attorneys generals, creating a task force to actually identify um, harms of social networking as this started to emerge, and specifically MySpace at the time, right, and its effect on youth. Um, in 2009, you have this really interesting example where I mentioned where, you know, even though in 1998, the Children's Online Protection Act had passed, the Supreme Court officially struck down um, COPA. It found that it was unconstitutional because it claimed that it limited the First Amendment rights of adults in efforts to protect minors. Um, but in general, you know, even for minors um, online, uh, it, it found that they were not you're not able to exercise your First Amendment rights as as freely. And so, again, you see that trade off between privacy, free speech and safety. Um, and so we kind of fast forward to the modern era, 2022 um, where you have the Kids Online Safety Act, or COSA. This was introduced um, by Senators Blumenthal and Blackburn. Um, and basically, Congress introduced this legislation that would require social media platforms to do more to protect minors from harm. And there's a lot of provisions in that bill, which we can talk about later. But those same debates that were happening in 1998 and then later in 2009 when COPA got rolled back 
are happening today with kids online safety. And so you have groups on both sides, sometimes parents on both sides and progressive advocates on both sides, conservative advocates on both sides, because some are focused more on this issue of safety and they want to get that right. Others are focused on privacy and how do we make sure that, you know, we don't in the effort to make the online um, community safer, we don't end up over collecting about our kids and, uh, you know, adults and others who are exploring. So that's kind of a brief history. Um, and yeah, maybe we can go to the next slide to talk about um, how this relates to government. So this is probably common knowledge from a lot of the folks um, already here. You learned it either in a civic class or schoolhouse rock. But, you know, I just wanted to briefly talk about the three branches of government here and then talk about one specific um, one in particular, the legislative branch, where you know, I had the chance to to serve in the U.S. Senate as a technology policy fellow. Um, so, you know, starting exactly there with the legislative branch, the legislative branch makes laws. You have the body of Congress split into two chambers, the Senate, the upper chamber and House of Representatives, the lower chamber. It's an interesting body because you have 100 senators and you have 435 House of Representatives. And altogether, all these offices almost operate like their own business, sometimes I say, where the CEO is that representative in Congress. And so a lot of times when we wonder why aren't things happening, why aren't we getting consensus? It's because imagining trying to get 535 people all corralled in a room on the same page is, is quite difficult. And you do have staff under each of those offices who are learning about the issues, hearing from people on the ground, um, and we can talk about that more. The executive branch obviously carries out the laws. So you have the president, the vice president, and the cabinet. We talked about, you know, how President Ronald Reagan had officially established NECMEC. And so the executive branch can sometimes move ahead, really, of the legislative branch. When that consensus building is taking time, you can pass an executive order to look into data privacy and, and other things like that. And so we see that actually today with artificial intelligence, where you see the executive branch and the president moving kind of ahead of Congress in terms of passing safety laws around um, artificial intelligence. And then you have the judicial branch, which is evaluating the laws. You have the Supreme Court, and then you have other federal courts that roll up. And, um, you know, it is also crucial in terms of the lawmaking process because it's evaluating if laws are constitutional. And that gets back to that timeline where even if Congress passes a law, it does undergo review. And if there are lawsuits of something violating the Constitution, you know, namely the First Amendment, the Supreme Court and other courts can actually overturn that and, um, you know, deem either that legislation to be on its whole unconstitutional or pieces of it. And so it just creates this very complicated, you know, network and interweb of um, policies and ideas. And sometimes it's hard for just an average parent, an average citizen, an administrator, an educator to digest what's going on. But ultimately, all of these actions end up affecting our youth and affect schools, affect, you know, our way of life. And so, again, that kind of gets to the focus of the talk, which is how do we just make sense of this um, complicated landscape? Maybe we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to just take this image and take us back to earlier in the year, January 31st, 2024, um, where something kind of remarkable was happening in Congress, again, also devastating and sensitive. So it was all of these things in one. Um, and I was, um, you know, a fellow in Congress at this time. So I, I watched as these big tech CEOs were essentially called into the Senate to testify before the Senate um, Judiciary Committee. And what was very interesting was that, so you had CEOs from, you know, this is Mark Zuckerberg from Meta. You had, um, you know, high up officials from uh, X and Snapchat and, and other um, and TikTok. And so, you know, some of the CEOs came voluntarily. Some were subpoenaed, meaning they were compelled by law to actually come and testify. And some even, you know, defied the first subpoena and, and it took some time to get them there. So kind of just also paints the landscape of where we are a little bit with, um how tough an issue this is and how much some of these big tech companies maybe don't want to kind of come in front of everybody and come publicly to talk about these issues. Um, and maybe some are, are uh, voluntarily doing that. 
Um, but what was really interesting and unique about this is that most hearings in the Senate um, and in the House, but I can only really speak to the Senate, aren't filled to the brim. You've got, you know, 20, 30 people. Most of the people there already are experts on the issues. They're lobbyists. They're paid to be there. Um, this hearing room was filled with not just the lobbyists that I mentioned, not just the reporters, but parents um, who have lost children to, um, you know, teen mental health issues and to suicide and really, really tough and devastating issues that are taking place in the lives and homes and families across the country. And so you had this really interesting juxtaposition where you had, you know, not only legislators in the room confronting big tech, but then you had big tech and the legislators being confronted by constituents and by parents who who are on the ground um, and have been fighting for regulation for years in some cases. And so rarely do you have all these groups kind of sitting in one place. And so that's why it was really um, kind of a, a, a pivotal moment, I would say. So, you know, I think the impact that this has had is that it's pushed certain legislators to come out um, for stricter social media legislation. Um, in most cases, the Senate Judiciary Committee that is in question in this picture um, actually passed a set of five unanimous social media pe- social media legislation um, or bills, essentially. And rarely does that happen, um, you know, when you have kind of the polarization that we have in Congress today, where unanimously things pass out of the committee. So um, I want to dig into one bill that actually had been discussed in a different committee, but is one that I worked on and and one that I think we can um, dig into. So that's on the next slide. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about this bill, the Kids Online Safety Act. I mentioned it earlier in the slides. It was introduced in 2022 by Senators Blumenthal and um, Senator Marsha Blackburn um, and from Connecticut and Tennessee. And I only bring this one up again because it is, it's kind of an interesting case study. It's one that I worked on as well. Um, and it is still not, you know, law. So it has not passed the Senate. It's not passed the House. It's not been signed into law by the president. And so kind of trying to pull the thread of why is that? Um, so I just split this into proponents of the bill and opponents of the bill uh, and why they kind of are arguing for their different cases. So folks that are in favor um, of the Kids Online Safety Act, like that, it imposes this duty of care on online platforms to do a better job of safeguarding children and relieving parents of that burden. Because what you'll find is, I think, um, up until this point, a, a lot of discussion has been about, you know, the philosophy that the best thing we can do for our kids to have a safer experience online is to educate parents and to give them more control um, over what their children see online. And I do still think that's a hugely important component, but I think there's been a lot of pushback from parents um, actually reaching out to their representatives saying it's difficult enough to parent um, and to raise a kid, but in this world where social media is prolific and things change so quickly, it's, pretty impossible to to know exactly what your child's looking at and to in, and to really feel sure that it's a safe experience. And so this legislation actually takes that into consideration and it imposes this higher duty of care on online platforms. And I can talk about that too if there's questions about it because this was a huge point of contention. Um because when you start to get into defining what is that duty of care, um if you don't define it clearly enough, you start to get pushed back on all sides. People say, oh, that's too broad of a definition. It's giving social media companies complete license to take off anything they want or to put anything they want. Um, or it's too specific. And now we're not getting at the core issues of safety and online. And so getting that balance correct has been an ongoing challenge for this bill. Um, other things that uh, proponents and supporters of the bill like is that it requires companies to set really strong privacy protections by default. We don't have a national privacy law today. Um, And, you know, and that's different from other countries like in the European Union. They have the GDPR, which I'm forgetting what it stands for right now. But that is a national privacy law that applies to all social media companies, really any company that's collecting any information on citizens within the European Union. The United States doesn't have a national privacy law today. There have been efforts to kind of get this passed. But in the absence of that, 
you know, there are ways still that Congress and legislators are trying to get privacy protections in place. And this is an example of one of them where maybe we can't get a wholesale privacy law just through right, you know, right now, but, um, you know, maybe we can impose on social media companies that have huge reach to set stronger privacy protections um, specifically for children um, and for specifically for minors. Um, you know, the third bullet here talks about actually putting uh, provisions in place to allow kids and teens to disable data driven recommendation algorithms. We all know what this is like. It doesn't matter if you're um, an adult or a kid. We've all been targeted with ads. And so, you know, using um, legislation here to allow us to have a knob to turn that off could be potentially really interesting rather than just kind of taking it but taking it for granted that the experience online with social media is to is to be inundated with ads. Um, and then it requires companies to perform annual audits to assess to assess risk to minors. And I think that's also really interesting because it's kind of this feedback loop. You you pass a law and sometimes we just have no idea what the effects of these laws are once it finally goes uh, into effect. And so this is supposed to kind of create that check um, uh, where you actually have companies performing audits to assess potential risk. I think all of us would agree that a lot of this sounds really, really good and useful and necessary. I think I, I personally do. Um, but there are still opponents of the bill and not all of them are social media companies. And so, you know, just saying don't regulate us. And so I, even when I was um, a fellow, I was curious, like, why is that? Why? What are the arguments on the other side coming from groups like the ACLU, coming from LGBTQ plus advocacy groups? Why wouldn't they want kind of this bill to pass? And so they talk about some of these unintended consequences, unintended censorship, where you might limit access to critical resources. And this isn't kind of just hypothetical. It's happened in the past when we tried to pass like safety laws, where if you don't get that definition right of what's harmful content, you don't maybe provide certain exceptions for, um, you know, educational material and things that could actually be really useful for a convening space for young people to gather and talk about issues, then a lot of these groups can get you know, removed from social media because they want these companies don't want to be held liable. So that's one thing that can happen. First Amendment violations, because ultimately what this would be is in some form a government mandated content moderation. I think it's hard to argue otherwise. And so I think if it's something that we all agree on, then that's great. But what if one day, you know, Congress passes something that that, that, that we don't agree on and we want to have the ability as we do in the United States of freedom of speech. So it kind of brings those questions um, up. And then finally, if we this bill would also impose restrictions on what age groups are allowed to actually create a social media account. I think it's kids under 13 would not be able to. It might be off by a number there. But if you have that restriction on age, well, how do you verify age? You have to collect certain information from people who are online. And so now that could potentially violate privacy protections to freely browse the web. So I bring all this up not to say I am for one or the other, or that you should be for one or the other. I think it's just to raise that this is a debate um, and that when there is a debate, when there is gray area, what you don't want is for social media companies to be the only voice in the room or to maybe just have legislators who maybe aren't on social media to be the only voice in the room. What you really want are the voices of parents, educators, students to be the ones actually coming through because they're the ones who are not only impacted, but they deal with the technology every day. So that's kind of the takeaway for me. And I just put at the bottom here, um, co-sponsors, the number of co-sponsors in the Senate has actually gone up on this piece of legislation. It started with 32, but then it got revised and you got more support in the Senate. It, it reached 46 and then you got even more support in the Senate, it reached 60. And you know, the thing that changed those numbers and brought in the support, it was actually parents and educators coming in and saying, we don't like this language and we want to modify that language. So that is, I hopefully think, a powerful message of um, what we can actually achieve when we're, we're engaged. Um, and so now 60 senators are at least in support of this. That's enough for it to pass the Senate. We have to wait for that to happen. But it's interesting to see the growth there. Um, I wanted to just now go to the last slide here, probably getting close to my time, but just really quickly talk about you know, what can you do? Um, you know, I know that we have a variety of folks here um, who, but the one thing that, you know, we all have in common is thinking about the future generation of youth and how do we make the digital experience a good experience? Um, and so I, I kind of just put together these three bullet points, but 
Um, you know, starting locally, I think, is, is the most important thing. The, the U.S. Department of Justice actually has a page where they recommend parents coming up with an online safety plan with your children, uh, because that's really the age that we're in now, where that's a huge part of uh, a kid's experience. You don't have to be an expert on technology yourself to kind of come up with what are good ways to navigate the, the um, social media landscape. Understanding your school district's policies is huge, because that's, again, a lot of times what ends up filtering down to what your, your kids are learning. Um, and then if an incident occurs, reporting it to the right channels, to the FBI or to that uh, organization, NECMEC, that I mentioned at the top. Um, number two, knowing digital issues. So again, you don't have to be, I think, a engineer or a tech expert to realize that data privacy and security are key issues today. And especially for minors who can't vote and don't have a voice yet, at least in the um, you know voting process and in that process, we kind of have to be advocates for them. But I talk about later, I think there's still huge ways where students are already engaging, even if they don't, you know, aren't voting yet. Um, another big issue is artificial intelligence. So, you know, that's with ChatGPT. Everyone is interacting with AI every single day. And this can accelerate not just the spread of good information, but bad information. And so looking at technology ultimately as something that's here to stay, I don't think now that chat GPT's release, it's pretty hard to put it away because it's useful in many contexts. But how do we promote responsible innovation? How do we make sure that like, we don't just leave it again up to, I think, just big tech to decide what's right or wrong, but we actually have a voice in the technology that we use as consumers. And so that brings, I think, us to the third piece of civic engagement. I think the most powerful way to make an impact is to share your stories. And I know that Digital for Good and I Can Help does this really well, where we actually capture stories of students using media um, for for good, to talk about anti-bullying, to talk about mental health awareness. And so finding that coalition of other parents and educators, I think, is number one huge. And then strategically finding time to reach out to senators and representatives. I know it sounds tedious, but I've been on the side where people are calling, and I've seen it. I've seen the impact that it has. You know, the senator I worked for actually responded to all the letters that came through and would actually reach his desk. The only thing is it has to reach a certain number for it to reach a desk, given all the other things that are going on. So, you know, finding those right times to engage with the senator, if they're on recess, you can actually look up the Senate calendar or the House calendar and see when Congress is in recess or when they're in session. When they're in recess, they're all back home. So you could go to a town hall. You could try to ask these questions. If they're back in Congress, well, that could be a really good time to call um, the phones, to write a letter. Um, and then finally, I think the third big and probably most important thing is to engage kids to be civically minded and to use their own voice because they're the ones ultimately using this technology, growing up with technology, they're digital natives. I, I say that as somebody who's, you know, almost 30. So I, technology, I think I've grown up with it, but a little bit later in my life, my younger brother, who's three years younger than me, I already, he uses technology in a way I don't. And so things keep changing so rapidly that we've got to engage kids in all these discussions. So with that, I'm going to close and uh, pass it back to you, um, Lola and others, but thank you so much and happy to answer questions later on. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the chat. Reminder, feel free to ask any questions. So perhaps I'll start. I'm sure you're aware of the recent legislation that's being passed in Texas and other states that is putting age restrictions on sites, uh, on pornography sites, and how that's causing them to fully shut down. How does that, what what are the debates surrounding that, and how does that impact kind of the freedom of speech uh, aspect of it, and how can companies verify age in, a, in an effective manner without having to shut down their platforms? What a great question, and I think it's super timely. You have Texas, you have Florida, you have other states who are looking into doing this, um, and it's and it's reached the Supreme Court, so, you know, it's important. I think it's a challenging issue, but it's one that it's useful to monitor what's happening when it's a state-by-state -state issue, and sometimes we get irritated, right, first of all, just to set the stage, that our federal government isn't moving fast enough, and why is it moving fast enough? Sometimes what is happening is that we're looking at the impacts of what happens in a state like Texas or in Utah or in Florida and kind of seeing what the fallout is, I guess, um, you know, and before making something that is federal and wide sweeping, it's interesting to understand what's happening more locally um, and what are the challenges presented with that. Your question about 
um, what are ways that maybe we can do age verification in a safe way is actually an active issue that's being studied right now. So I think if you search like digital identity, that's a kind of an emerging tech area that researchers and technologists are looking into. Um, It was brought up again when, you know, COVID vaccine cards were um, a thing. And, uh, you know, maybe if you're going through TSA, you're familiar with kind of being scanned um, and you can actually choose to opt out of that process and you're still allowed to go through TSA um, without, without hindrance. So um, I think like we can borrow other examples in society where we're trying to see does a digital identity card or a certain way to identify who you are, is that something that we can do in a safe way without violating privacy protections and without that being abused? And I'll say that one thing that people bring up in the international debate is as much as some companies within the U.S. are collecting data and there is a whole data broker ecosystem of collecting our data and selling it. And nobody's happy about that. That's the one thing that no matter what side of the aisle you're on, you're like against data brokers. People do point out that it's easier to legislate U.S. companies than it is to legislate foreign companies. And so when you have other entities from other foreign countries, you know, building apps and I guess I'm alluding to TikTok, you know, that are collecting our data, um, it you you have more privacy questions with them, but sometimes it's harder to actually enact legislation when it's a foreign company versus it's a, a company built on U.S. soil. So I don't know if I answered your question purely because I think it's a complicated one, but I just bring some of that up to raise like, you know, doing your own research is important. Feel free to opt out. That should be something that we're, I think, always pushing for. Like if we don't feel comfortable with how our data is being used, we should be able to opt out, opt out of certain things. Um, and if we can come up with ways to do age verification that don't actually cache what they call personally identifying information, but it there's there's other ways of doing it. I'm not just gonna, I'm not going to get too technical, but there are ways of verifying who you are without actually storing that information long term who you are. I think that would be the right balance if we can achieve it. Thank you, and I I mean I am also reading up on these debates, and it is very complicated. Um, Someone is asking, what do you think was the main factor for more laws to be formed to protect kids on social media? Yeah, um, I think it's like, you know, it's going back to the timeline I had. I think this started a lot with pornographic material. And um, there was, to, to nerd out a little bit on policy, there is one of the big things that keep get, keeps getting brought up, and you might hear it if you start Googling, is Section 230, Section 230, and what is that? So there was the Communications Decency Act of 1996 that passed. And in that, there was a section, 230, that was added that basically is described as like the the words that invent, that created the internet. Because what it did was it created an exception for certain online platforms that operate more like a marketplace to not be held responsible for what other people post on their website. So if you build a website and there's a trap feature and someone posts something, you shouldn't be held responsible for what somebody else says. And that kind of immunity or exception or whatever you want to call it is actually what allowed social media companies to flourish because they, you know, didn't have to be as careful about moderating the content that was online. You know, fast forward now 20 years into the social media age and I think that people realize now that while that created a lot of innovation and a lot of cool technology and use cases and building, you know, connections with people you hadn't met in 20 years, while that it allowed, it allowed for this, it also introduced a lot of bad content that's online and it kind of has made the experience a little bit harmful with ads and, and targeting and things like that. And so I think that in my mind is what spurred now, like looking back, um, is what spurred the debate around how do we protect kids online? It's some of these research that's coming out about teen mental health crisis. And I just think probably looking ahead, AI is going to be like the next big technology that everybody has is all riled up about. And people are worried that if we just don't build it responsibly, we're going to have that same effect with social media. You're going to get a lot of good, but you're going to get a lot of bad. And how do we find ways to maximize the good and minimize the bad? So. Thank you for that answer. Um, Somebody is uh, saying, you mentioned parent responsibility a bit, and I believe this is equally important. Parents complain their child is being bullied online and want social media to fix it. How about parents knowing what their kids are saying 
themselves on social media and addressing responses they perceive as bullying. Potentially, bullying can come out of nowhere, but often is a response to some conversation or posting their own child's making. So I think this this comment is uh, kind of asking about this negotiation between parent responsibility and tech company responsibility, if you want to talk more on that point. Yeah, and I think it's a really good point. It It really is always, like, it's not black or white. It is a combination of these two two groups. And sometimes no one knows what's better for their kid than a parent, right? So um, I think the challenge is that social media companies versus, let's say, you know, um, other consumer experiences like going to the DMV or buying something at Walmart or, you know, things that are kind of like one-off experiences as a consumer social media isn't really a one-off experience. You can actually build an entire network of friends. You can build an entire understanding of the news and current events on social media. And so I think it's really hard for a parent to understand that entire world um, Mm -hmm. on behalf of their children. And that's the only reason that I think it kind of has pushed back a little bit in recent debate to the social media companies. But I'm in agreement with you that I think if, if it's kind of like, necessary but not sufficient if the parent if parents aren't involved you can't really do anything right there's going to be no technical solution or one sweeping social media policy change that makes the experience safer for your kids if you're not involved so i think that is necessary but even the most well-intentioned parents are running up against this this um challenge and so i think it's a balance between the two And someone's asking, what do you think the best way to break down this topic to parents is? Yeah, um, I think, well, I would want to dig into what you mean by this topic. So I guess the aim of this talk was a little bit to break break that down, but it was more from the government side and us grappling with what's going on over there in the ivory towers of Congress and in D.C. Um, but if the goal is not so much trying to educate parents about legislation and all that type of stuff. And it's more just what are good techniques? Um, there's actually good resources online. So, um, you know, maybe that's something I, I think in my initial prep for the talk, I sent a few, a few links, but I can also dig up some more neck, you know, neck, neck, even though it is a center for, um, uh, you know, sexual exploitation and missing children, they actually have like pages that are just like general advice to parents on how to prevent that from happening, how to make sure that your child is safe online. Department of Justice, like I mentioned, the Federal Trade Commission has um, pages on privacy and specifically kids privacy because there's a law, COPPA, the Children Online Privacy Protection Act, that is different from the one I mentioned, has an extra P, and it's, it's specifically about kids privacy but it is extremely outdated. And so there's conversation going on right now about building a COPPA 2.0. So um, when you ask about the best way to break this t- down this topic to parents, I think there's already resources online that maybe it's just a matter of connecting them. Um, and maybe we could have school districts, you know, engaging their parents. We could have, I don't know if it's overreach to have like the HOA talking about, hey, like if, if we know we have a community of a lot of parents with young kids, let's just post some of these resources online just so people can find them. Um, but yeah, I think a big thing is just sharing resources. 